they get so over overwhelmed with the amount of migrants come, what they do is they issue them these fake 30-day or 60-day humanitarian visas. Mm -hmm. So on the Mexican side, when I'm reporting, before uh, migrants cross over illegally, you'll see these humanitarian visas discarded all over on the Mexican side. And the reason they do this is because they don't want U.S. government officials to know they've already been granting visa in another country. But the reason that the Mexican officials only give them a 30-day humanitarian... What's a 30-day what's humanitarian visa anyway? But... <laughs> Welcome back to This Is Your Country with Paige Willie. Today I have a very special guest, a good friend of mine, Jorge Ventura, who is a field reporter with The Daily Caller, who has been on the border reporting constantly for how long now? About a year or two? Year and a half, as, as soon as basically Biden came in office. Okay. I've been an honorary South Texan now because he's been keeping <laughs> me in South Texas covering the border. That's right. And Jorge has been fearless in going down there, getting right up close, looking at what is going on with the border crossings, with the cartel activity, with everything that you can imagine that comes with open borders policies. So I'm delighted to have him on. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Pace. It's going to be fun. So one reason why I wanted to invite you on is because the open borders experiment that Biden is foisting on the American people is often portrayed as this like humanitarian uh, imperative. Like we need to do it so that people can come here and live a better life. But so much of your reporting has shown that that is not the case. It is accompanied by a whole chasm of horrors. And one of the most recent things you've exposed is that the the law enforcement down there, the services down there on these border towns, they cannot even keep up with the dead bodies that are nope. turning up. So speak a little bit about that. Yeah, it's getting really um, sad. So for folks who don't know, a lot of these border towns in Texas, I mean, they're extremely small towns. They don't even have any type of resources. So if you remember last year, Paige, um, around this time last year is when the 15,000 Haitians were under the bridge in Del Rio. Uh, for folks who don't know, Del Rio is a small town of maybe 17,000 people. They only have actually five ambulances for like the whole town. So during that whole time, American taxpayers, when they were calling in 911, they actually didn't have any ambulance available. Yes. They were used for the migrants. So fast forward till today, um, the crossings have obviously been nonstop. The fiscal year just ended, but they, they reached 2 million crossings. Just um, That's just the crossings that Border Patrol was able to apprehend. That's not even right. counting um, the Godaway. So I just left Eagle Pass, Texas. So for folks who don't know, Eagle Pass is officially the deadliest crossing point throughout the whole southern border. What makes Eagle Pass uh, the deadliest is because they have the Rio Grande River right there. And I've been down there reporting. The thing is with the Rio Grande River is the waters are extremely de deceptive. So if you're there, it's like, oh yeah, just a quick, easy swim. But as soon as you get in the water, and I, and I know from experience of going in with these groups, um, those those currents, I mean, sweep away folks. It's strong enough to sweep away grown men. So you can imagine what a current could do with, to women and children with backpacks and things like that so we've been down there we've been uh, reporting on the drownings um on my we just literally left last week where we were reporting on the mexican side and we actually saw a drowning happen we, we had our cameraman there and they, we, we saw the body actually pulled out it was very gruesome but we felt it was important for like the american people to see and we were speaking with officials down there and, and i was speaking with maverick county deputy constable his name is frank bowles what he told me was they're starting to um basically bury these bodies in their own local cemetery mm -hmm. The thing is, is now they're running out of space in their local cemetery for the dead bodies. So now Maverick County is contacting the state of Texas and say, hey, we need re refrigerated trailers to preserve the body. The worst of it, too, is that uh, the majority of the bodies that are being uh, buried, they are uh, unidentified. So when I was there, um, you get to see like the makeshift crosses. They say like, um, you know, John Doe for the men, uh, Jane Doe for the women. But the heartbreaking part was I saw several uh, baby John Does mm -hmm. with the most recent infant drowning uh, August 13th. And so th it's it's for them, it's a you know, it's a humanitarian crisis. So like the people, you know, you go to the border, they don't see a left or right. They're seeing humans or right, you know, literally like dying on the footsteps of, of American soil. And it's getting to the point where they're literally running out of space to put the dead bodies. It's uh, I mean, it's it's really, really gruesome. And it's not just Maverick County. Other counties throughout Texas are, are literally saying we, we don't have capacity um, to basically, you know, take in all these all these basically deceased bodies at this point. Gosh, it's astonishing and it's really, really sad. And it's one of the most frustrating things for the American people is that they see this as the obvious consequence of Biden's policy changes. Like his first day in office, he signed a whole stack of executive orders indicating his desire to make it harder to deport people, make it easier for them to come, mm -hmm. make sure that the people making this treacherous journey and even this deadly journey, that uh, that these efforts will be rewarded by lax law enforcement or whatever policies may be to enable it. And so I think 
it's especially sad that you've got these situations in these border towns where people are so, the resources are stretched so thin, they are dealing with this traumatic, these gruesome discoveries, as mm -hmm. you say, almost on a daily basis. And the president cannot be bothered to take responsibility for this. He does not even acknowledge that this is a problem in his mind. It, it doesn't disturb him. It doesn't disturb his advisors. They have, I have never once heard them say as a goal that they want to reduce border crossings, that they want to reduce the suffering and mm. death that is attendant with these open borders policies. They've never even stated. It's like how I had a guest on a few weeks ago where they, uh, we were discussing the Biden administration's quote unquote harm reduction policies for dealing with the, the fentanyl addictions mm -hmm. and, the, and the drug crisis in this country. And when they use euphemisms like harm reduction or whatever it may be, they have deliberately construed it so that their goal is not to reduce suffering and death and addiction from uh, from drug overdoses. Their, their, their goal is not actually to reduce what's going on. And so that is like something that I think the American people are really disturbed and bothered by is that there there is no attempt to reduce what is happening when people are dealing with these so um, another facet that you have reported on is that when these towns are running out of resources, they're running out of shelter beds, they're running out of things like that. And I think it was when you were in El Paso mm -hmm. that you saw these families like camped out on sidewalks and on the streets because there is no space. There is nowhere to house these people. And this was literally after the Martha's Vineyard episode. So I went, we went, we went straight to El Paso. And what happens, uh, Paige, is when Border Patrol receives migrants, what they'll do is when they've reached overcapacity in their processing centers, then they go to the NGOs and shelters and say, hey, please help us out, you know, taking these migrants. And then, you know, NGOs and, and the shelters will help them out. But then those shelters reach overcapacity. So you actually had women and children sleeping on the streets of El Paso. I remember I interviewed a mother um, as she was digging for clothes and she had like a 10-month baby on her shoulder. And she was like, I have nowhere to go. I have no family and they just kicked kick me here on the street. And so when we're interviewing people telling their stories and what was fascinating to me from the reporter aspect was it didn't get the media outrage at all. I mean, you, we, we, were, we were literally seeing women and children sleeping on the streets of American streets, these, these migrants who we're supposed to be caring about, but it didn't get the media outrage. Um, you know, one thing for me as well, just from the media perspective is, could you imagine over 700 migrant deaths under a Trump administration, mm -hmm. what the media coverage would be? I mean, you would have Don Lemon, yeah. Uh, live from McAllen every night. You would have Anderson Cooper live from Yuma, Arizona. Um, but that's when I speak to folks on there is, is that's what's something that, that outrages them is that it doesn't get that media outrage and especially from the progressive side because the progressive side wants to say, um, you know, we care about black and brown people. Well, uh, newsflash, who do you think is dying at the border? It's black, it's black and brown migrants. But it doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't get that same media outrage. Also, for folks who don't know, the city of El Paso is a Democratic city. Mm -hmm. The Democratic mayor actually had to close a contract with a few charter buses, like million dollars worth of deals, and they're actually busing migrants to New York City. But it doesn't get that kind of, you know, same uh, media outrage. But for me, I've been really trying to focus on the humanitarian aspect. So, you know, these these people, they are also being taken advantage of by the cartels and human smugglers. Um, they're making up to $14, millions, uh, $14 million a day just literally smuggling, smuggling humans. We're not talking about the drugs. Um, but I think with, with more reporting and um, I think people are really waking up. Um, from a political standpoint, it doesn't actually make sense for the Democrats not even to talk about the issue because you have a voter base in South Texas who's been loyal to you for, I mean, some districts have been loyal for over 100 years. Yes. And I think Myra Flores' win is a huge uh, step into the right direction. I think we're, we're seeing Cassie Garcia, Monada de la Cruz right now as well. So even from a political standpoint, it doesn't even make sense not to talk about the issue right. because this this voter base that's loyal to you is starting to say, hey, we've been loyal to you, we're here, um, but we now have candidates that are saying that you're not addressing our issues and yeah. we're starting to see that. So it's, it's fascinating to see that, but um, it's also interesting to see how they don't really actually care about black and brown people when it comes to it. That's right. And and they it feels like they have decided almost as a party, like my, one of my observations has been that the messaging from the Democratic Party is always very tightly controlled, very mm -hmm. top down. And it seems like they have almost decided in a boardroom somewhere or in, you know, at their highest levels of their party mechanisms that um, they are not to discuss the downsides of open border policies ever. And so that even includes when people are, you know, dealing with these incredibly stretched thin resources, dead bodies, you name it, uh, they, they will not address it, they will not discuss 
else that they will not acknowledge. And, and another th- thing too, Paige, is if you remember, I mean, just a few years ago, there's that famous kind of uh, viral clip of Bernie Sanders talking about the Koch brothers and saying, yeah. oh no, open borders would be bad, not only for the migrants, but also for the for the American workers. And that's something that um, isn't talked about. And another aspect with law enforcement seeing these, these amount of dead bodies is uh, the mental health aspect. So when I did, I interviewed Maverick County Sheriff and he said, hey, um, the amount of bodies that we're seeing and, and, you know, pulling women and children, like this isn't normal for humans. So it's like my men and women are suffering yes. huge mental health toll. Um, about a month ago, Washington Examiner put out a, a story saying that um, they now have suicide counselors for Border Patrol. Yes. And unfortunately, like, I mean, literally yesterday, ni- around nine in the morning, National Guardsmen on post committed suicide in Eagle Pass. So this, is, a, this is another aspect that we have to remind ourselves is, is these people are are really stretched in themselves yes and are just seeing something that like i said it's not normal to be seen on on u.s u.s borders that's right it's it's like a war zone and it's i remember reading some interviews and some reporting about how the border patrol men and women they feel betrayed because their Mm -hmm. their purpose has been uh misappropriated from protecting Americans, keeping our country safe, you know, doing what they felt as their duty that they signed up for. And now it's being uh, sort of betrayed by the Biden administration, asking them to be like babysitters, but also like these sort of frontline emergency workers who are like pulling bodies out of rivers. Like it is a total, uh, they've repurposed whole organizations in our country that are designed to keep oh, the country safe so to sad. being like like the, the, these facilitators almost of human trafficking. Like no wonder these people are traumatized. Yeah, one of the, the famous quotes that I always remember is when Border Patrol agent told me, says, Jorge, I don't do border enforcement, I do border enrollment now. He's like, what I feel now is I'm an, I'm an Uber driver because you know, under Trump, when a family would come in illegally, they didn't want to see Border Patrol, right? They, they didn't want to be under the reign of Mexico. Under Biden, it's one of the crazier things is families cross in and they look for Border Patrol. Sometimes yes. I'll be on the scene and like if Border Patrol's not there, they'll come up to me and say, hey, can you walk us to um, a Border Patrol? So that's one thing that they their, their purpose really got hit. So when I speak with, with agents, they say, hey, I don't even feel like I'm doing my job. I actually feel like I'm almost um, aiding the cartel now by kind of helping this, transporting them in um, in airplanes. There was a few National Guardsmen that uh, spoke to Savannah Hernandez who said, hey, we're literally putting like migrant children on these planes, flying them in the middle of the night. Um, this doesn't feel right. So you, you, you're really seeing that. Um, one thing that really hit morale was um, in that whole kind of derail Haitian fiasco, if you remember, yes. um, the Biden administration accused the Border Patrol of the whipping. And then it was a year-long investigation, and they found out that there was no whipping. But yet, the Biden administration never took that back. So they feel that almost no one has their back at this point. I was just also, um, around three weeks ago, we were reporting in Eagle Pass. Mayorkas came down to visit, but Mayorkas kept it very secret. He didn't let no media know, um, but we, we were able to catch him. And a lot of Border Patrol agents were really upset with Mayorkas, and, and they felt that um, he isn't standing up for them. So... I'm really interested in just what's going to happen these next six months because they can't get enough agents. They're now putting up these crazy signing bonus trying to uh, get more agents. I think the suicide story that happened yesterday is going to change a lot of folks' mind of even wanting to yeah. be part of this. So it's it's a complete mess. And, you know, Paige, every month I say it can't get worse, and it actually does get worse. That's right. And to illustrate the extent to which whole institutions in our government have been repurposed around facilitating the open borders experiment. I remember reading last year as the crisis was really starting to ramp up with high, much higher volumes mm-hmm. of migrants coming, especially migrant children. Um, the New York Times had on its front page that the Biden administration was asking NASA workers to sign up to be functionally babysitters in these migrant facilities at the border saying, we don't have enough staff do do the are, are you looking for an exciting volunteer opportunity like sign up to be a volunteer with uh <laughs> with at, at the border in these in these illegal immigrant uh children's shelters and like again i am not exaggerating that i'm not making up it was on the front page of the new york times and then it's like a year later like can nasa even get their rockets off the ground maybe it's because their scientists are all babysitting illegal immigrant oh children God, at the border i don't know but um You have brought up a couple of really, really important angles of this issue, and one is the facilitating of child trafficking here Mm -hmm. and and the way these policies are helping cartels do what they want to do to devastating consequence. So I 
One thing I've tried to draw people's attention to is the sheer volume of children that are showing up crossing the border without their parents, like unaccompanied, Mm -hmm. they call them, you know, unaccompanied migrant children. And so that's now, I think for this past year, the estimate was 161,000 is what they were expecting. Not even, you know, like, oh my goodness, we we were totally surprised by these nearly 200,000, which is the size of a city, uh, children turning up without their parents. They were making these projections. And so my question is, you know, like, Congress doesn't seem worried about where all these children are going. The Biden administration doesn't seem to be worried about where all these children are going. In fact, I've featured on a previous episode how they seem to be actually making more policies that make it harder to turn back these giant volumes of children and say, who are you coming, you know, where are you coming from? Who are you and who are you with? Like, you you can't come to this country as like an unaccompanied 12-year-old. But... That's what they're doing. And the the some of the policies that I have um, in my research come across that they have uh, used to enable this are um, using public money to pay for the quote unquote sponsors to come mm-hmm. pick up their children from other parts of the country. And they don't even use the term relative because there's no way of knowing there's if these no people way. are these kids, parents, uncles, grandparents, whatever. So my question is, what have you seen that can help our listeners understand what is going on with all these children coming across the border? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you, you brought this point up because this is one of the more underreported stories, even in, in, in mainstream on the conservative right. It's not talked about enough. So in total, I believe the last number we got um, since Biden and Harris come in, 250,000 unaccompanied children have reached the border. Um, I've been reporting in Roma, Texas. And in Roma, um, we have video evidence um, of, of last year where you actually see human smugglers put these children on rafts and then bring them in, in rafts. And then when they get on American soil, you know, when we, we come up to these kids in cameras, all the kids are going to be wearing the colored bracelets. So this means that um, a cartel sold that, that, ch- that child for them to be um, basically able to get, get access to get on that raft to go inside the United States. So when you So for me, that was heartbreaking when you see these kids literally with um, these braces, different color braces, so different cartels. Uh, but most of them say the Spanish word entregas, meaning uh, delivered. So literally you're seeing human beings treated like packaged goods, like Amazon. Like, oh, yeah, here's your receipt. Here's here's the shipping. Um, so that's that's a that's an aspect of, of that is as they're coming in, in the middle of night. We've seen that uh, in Romo through cartels with uh, bracelets. The huge issue now is the U.S. government cannot properly vet. Uh, the sponsors. Yes. And uh, one of the first reports that actually came out in the mainstream was Axios last year. So this is not, you know, Breitbart or anyone on the right. This is literally, you know, from mainstream Axios. One out of three unaccompanied children that are being released in the U.S., the federal government is losing track of. Yes. Right? So when that story came out, I was absolutely shocked. And, um, you know, so I was reporting at the border during that time. And then um, from reporting at the border, I actually got found out about the illegal marijuana cartel industry in California. So started following, you know, reporting on that. Little did I know, and we started to find out, some of the children that are actually being smuggled through the southern border are actually being forced to work on these illegal marijuana operations. I'm not surprised to hear that at um, all. In California. We interviewed a, a man in Lancaster, California, um, who woke up around three in the morning and he went out to his, um, cause out there in the, in the deserts, we have water pumps, water lines for the farmers and things like that. So he, he woke up around three in the morning, look out to, went out to his, one of his water lines and found four Honduran teenagers tapped in, stealing the water illegally. So he pursued these teenagers and then found out that these, uh, these teenagers were in the country, not only illegally, but they were actually bringing the water back to an illegal marijuana operation. Wow. So in that actual report, the reason I'm making the connection is because with, when in actuals, they found out that a lot of these children are being lost in labor traffic. Mm -hmm. And then we actually got to see that in our own reporting um, in California. Reuters, literally just a month ago, like I said, it's not Breitbart or anyone on the fringe, right? Reuters just put put out a report. Houston Police Department is now raising us, trying to to sound the alarm that a lot of the migrant children that they released in Houston, guess what? Now they can't find the sponsors and they can't track down the children. So that right there is one of the more... Uh, alarming situations. Now, I've also been uh, in um, in Yuma, Arizona. It was about two months ago. We found an abandoned five-year-old boy that these two migrant women found in Mexicali. The two women tell me, we found this boy completely naked. And the smuggler basically was like, oh, I already got my money. Threw this little boy off. And the boy was passed away. So these women pick him up. They do the hour trek to Yuma, Arizona, and they cross the league. And the boy was absolutely passed out when we got to him. Uh, we raised up his sleeves, and the boy had two phone numbers. And we called, one of the, the calls was back to like a grandfather in Guatemala and he just like absolutely hung up. But the boy was absolutely like passed out and then he went into Border Patrol custody and it was heartbreaking because it's like, we don't know what's gonna happen to him. We don't know his, his sponsors. Um, in that same report that I was doing in Roma with the cartel bracelets, I actually ran into a sister and two brothers. The sister was like 10 years old, one brother was eight and the other one was 12. 
and I'm interviewing. I'm like, you guys came here alone. Your mom sent you here. Like, yeah, they sent us alone. We went into it with these people we don't know. And as I'm interviewing, I said that article actually just popped in my head. I said, wait a minute. I'm interviewing two brothers and sisters. Little do they know one of them is literally going to go missing in the United States in some type of labor trafficking situation. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the issues that isn't talked about enough. Yes. And like I said, Reuters has reported, so it's not like a fringe outlet. Um, and like I said, in our own reporting in California with the legal marijuana operations, we ran into uh, teenagers are being basically forced to work on the girls. Yes. And I'm so glad that you're covering some of this because this is something that I have been tracking steadily on my podcast. I did an episode called... Uh, the Biden doctrine, human sacrifices for open borders, meaning like look at what they are willing mm -hmm. to tolerate for the open borders experiment. And these people are victims and it is beneath our country. It is a horrifying, horrifying situation. And so a couple of things uh, that uh, come to mind. One is that when they had this issue with all of the unaccompanied illegal immigrant children, you know, coming to the border, especially right, you know, when he took office and it was all like mm -hmm. starting to be this like, you know, this ascendant crisis. Uh, Mayorkas goes and says, we need to focus on getting these kids out of the border facilities and into their, you know, the homes of their sponsors because a border facility is no place for a child. And I was just thinking of all of this, um, reporting that I've read over the past several years, um, simply because I'm interested in the topic of immigration on, you know, children and teenagers showing up working in meatpacking plants, children and teenagers, you know, coming across the border mm. illegally, showing up uh, working in poultry farms, egg farms, uh, farms, just like you say, marijuana farms, you name it, picking crops, whatever. And I'm just thinking, okay, so Mayorkas thinks that a, a border facility is no place for a child, but he does think a poultry plant or a meatpacking plant or an illegal marijuana farm where they're, you know, they've got phone numbers tattooed on their arms is a place for a child. And I just think that this is such a large scale problem that no one is paying attention to. And it's even becoming, and people may think like, oh, that's got to be a really rare instance. Surely we would catch it. But as you pointed out, it's mm. one in three children. They don't know where they're and, going and that's in from this Axios. country. Yes, from I mean, Axios. That, that's, that's not from like, you're reading some fringe comparisons. That's Axios. And like I said, even Houston PD is like, hey, we can't find some of these migrant children that have been released in our city. Yes. I mean. And, oh. and the, the it goes to show that they know that this is a, a real problem because Congress has investigated this before. Mm -hmm. During the Obama administration, there was a big problem with these children coming across the border, turning up, as I say, like they had, like Rob Portman was doing an investigation into a situation, just like I said, you know, children turning up, working in like an egg farm in Ohio or living in like a dilapidated trailer with some guy who was claiming that he was like their uncle. And it's yep. like, no one does this to their own family. Are you kidding me? The government placed these children with someone who was forced them into, you know, indentured servitude. And so Congress did some investigations. I don't know whatever really came of that because it clearly the problem, do you think the problem has gotten, you know, better since they've, they've ramped up the volumes of children like coming over the border? Like, obviously this has gotten worse. Congress has, you know, sitting on their hands, they could make laws at any time that, you know, change how the funding is dealt with, change these policies, hold, you know, investigate the Biden administration for their role in this, but they don't, which is just astonishing. And we don't see AOC out there crying with the kids in the cages. No. And now we even have more uh, ki kids in the cage. It's it's one of the more um, heartbreaking stories. A lot of people don't know it's um, some of these children that do come out. You said it, they're actually a denture servant. So they actually have a debt uh, uh, yes. to pay. Um, so we and I've seen this from SoCal to Northern California. If you're actually in Northern California, they have a word for this. They call them uh, trimigrants mm -hmm. because these are the migrants that they're smuggled them. And they literally just force them to work uh, on these uh, illegal grow operations. We actually inter interviewed a firefighter in Shasta County up in Northern California that um, during during wildfire season, they rescued three migrants that refused to leave an illegal marijuana operation. They were basically about to burn to death. So when the firefighter saved them, he said, why didn't you guys leave? We were trying to help you guys out. And the migrants said, well, we were scared for our life that if we left the farm, that the leader of this operation will kill us. Yes. And he's like, what do you mean? And what he found out was that these migrants were outside of a Home Depot two to three hours away from the from the mountains in Northern California. They get picked up. And next thing they know, they're held gunpoint by the cartel. And this, this happens... Um, all over the all over the the country, and the thing is, from the other side is, they always preach we care about black and brown people. Where the where you know we have sympathy, empathy, all that, all the all the key words. But now that the situation is literally ten times worse, um, there's no there's nowhere there's nowhere need to be found. And um, these kids are continuing to come in record That's numbers. Right. Like I said if you go to Roma right now, middle of the night, they're smuggled in in boat rafts. In New Arizona, they're just uh, brought in in the middle of the night in the deserts. And sometimes, like even being as reported, it's eerie because you know when 
an adult is with the children and you know he's not the parent. By the way that they grab the child, they like, it's just eerie. I can't describe it. Um, and as a reporter, I mean, we can't do anything there. Uh, but it's it's truly heartbreaking. And the numbers are, I mean, almost a qu- we're at a quarter million children. Yes. What are we going to be at by the end of this uh, Kamala Harris Biden administration? Right. And, and where are they going in this country and what's happening to them? And th- I'm so glad to have you on uh, putting some details on this issue because as I say, they, they like to portray it as, oh, these are innocent families coming across making this difficult journey. It's our duty to welcome them. And you have seen with your own eyes by how these traffickers mm-hmm. treat children that these are not, in many cases, families. They are children being kidnapped or, or sold and, you know, transported as if they're, uh, you know, I, I've been calling them in some cases mail order children. They'll, yep. Some of them turn up. I'm sure you've seen the photos. You may have been, even have been the reporter who um, uh, showed this to the world. There were kids who showed up with like they were wearing t-shirts and there was like addresses yep. like written on the back in sharpie and i was like these children are literally being delivered like a mail package it's so sad and another kind of key element uh page that it's also been unreported is the the role that the mexican government is playing in, in this border yes. crisis and what i mean by that is um so for folks who who, who don't know um, so a uh, majority of migrants, when they are crossing illegally in the U- U.S., when they get to Guatemala and they cross illegally in, into Mexico, the first uh, Mexican town they hit is called Tapachula. So when they hit Tapachula, what what happens is officials there are actually not supposed to let them even pass Tapachula because they're in Mexico illegally. But what Tapachula officials have done is um, because so many migrants are coming and they've been overwhelmed. I think it's also, you know, there's also a, a role of Mexican government playing here. But they get so overwhelmed with the amount of migrants come. What they do is they issue them these fake 30-day or 60-day humanitarian visas. Wow. So on the Mexican side, when I'm reporting, before uh, migrants cross over illegally, you'll see these humanitarian visas discarded all over on the Mexican side. And the reason they do this is because they don't want U.S. government officials to know they've already been granting visa in another country. But the reason that the Mexican officials only give them a 30-day humanitarian... What's a, what's a 30-day humanitarian visa anyway? Right. <laughs> but the only reason they give them a 30-day humanitarian visa is what Mexican officials are doing. They said, hey, uh, here's a 30-day humanitarian visa. This visa gives you legality to travel through Mexico mm. and uh, will let you reach that uh, Mexican border state town to cross illegally. So you have a 30-day pass. Do whatever you got to do. Take the bus, fly, whatever. But Mexican um, police can't stop you now. Wow. And this is a 30-day pass to cross illegally. So do whatever you, whatever you <laughs> need to do. So it's fascinating to see, like I said, on the Mexican side, these um, these cars are all over the place. Even last year when the Haitians came, a lot of Americans are like, oh my God, how did these 15,000 Haitians leave this island? Well, no, they they didn't. They've been living in Chile for mm-hmm. years. Then they got this humanitarian visa, which gave them the illegality to travel through Mexico. And now they're in the country illegally. Governor Greg Abbott back in April um, basically made four agreements with four different Mexican state governors saying, hey, if you don't flow the 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 flow of illegal immigrants and um, the drugs, we're going to uh, input a 100% uh, percent vehicle inspection on you when you cross over to Texas, which Mexico cannot have. Right. So Mexico signed the agreement and the illegal crossings have not stopped. Mm-hmm. So we've been in Pedas Negros following these massive caravans with these visas. They, they get through Mexican officials and they cross um, illegally. So that's another role is the Mexican officials don't feel any pressure from this administration. Uh, Tapachula, I highly recommend audience to, re- to research Tapachula and you'll see these humanitarian visas. It's absolutely fascinating. I mean, 30 day, 60 day humanitarian visas granting these folks legality to travel. It's a 30 day pass to come into our country illegally and there's no pressure from Biden under Trump he put so much pressure on Mexico. Mexico actually lined up um, their own National Guard on that on that Guatemala southern border, and they stopped the migrants from coming in. Under this administration, is here's a 30 day pass, 30 day pass, just get over there. <laughs> it's a pipeline. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. I'm really gr- glad that you brought that up because. One thing that was totally underappreciated about how President Trump was dealing with the illegal immigration issue at the southern border was that he threatened tariffs yep. on Mexico. He said to the president of Mexico, OK, you don't want to help us uh, stem this flow of people coming into our country illegally. How would you enjoy tariffs slapped on everything that you guys send to mm-hmm. our country? You know, tomatoes, avocados, whatever. And of course, you had all these globalists in, in our country saying that will cause a recession. Americans won't be able to buy a single tomato. How can he? How can he? But I mean, leverage works. You have to make policy in the national interest towards the goals that you're trying to achieve. And so the, the, the president of Mexico, he immediately snapped to and he said, understood, yep. understood. And But in these cases, and I think that even some of the Central American presidents, um, Mexico aside, because they clearly feel that they have all the leverage over the right. situation, you know, that they, they have no incentive to really help Biden solve this problem whatsoever. Um, 
there was some conference where they were boycotting, you know, the, the mm. this conference that Biden was attending. And I think in one way, they see the Biden policy of sort of like, let's, you know, you know, the only way that people in these countries can have a better life is if you come to America and we, our taxpayers, our, our prosperous people, give them a lifetime free stay to, to, uh, to assuage their misery in their home country. To me, it makes me wonder, how do these home countries that these people are coming from not see this as a tremendous insult. I'm so glad that you um, brought this up. So over the summer, there was the Conference of Americas, right? So South America, Central America, United States, Canada, they all meet up to discuss issues. The Biden administration reached out to the Central America countries and said, hey, we would like for you guys to attend so we could discuss immigration. For folks who don't know, Nayib Bukele, president of El Salvador, is has been one of the best presidents on the issue of immigration. Under Trump, him and, uh, him and Bukele and Trump worked amazingly together. Uh, one of uh, the reason why Bukele supported Trump's immigration policies is, is what Bukele said. It says, hey, for us to improve El Salvador's economy and for us to bounce back from, you know, obviously the years of MS-13 and things like that, we needed Salvadorians in El Salvador, right? So he loved Trump's administration because it kept Salvadorans in El Salvador. And then uh, Bukele was able to introduce new policies when it comes to human trafficking and human smuggling. Fast forward to the Biden administration, Bukele has been absolutely frustrated. El Salvador and the uh, um, United States relationship is not good at this moment. And because Bukele has seized, has seized Biden's open uh, border policies, completely damaged you know, everything that El Salvador was, was trying to create yes. with his strong uh, border policies. So when that uh, Conference of America came, uh, Bukele declined to meet with Kamala Harris and uh, Biden administration. And um, till today have been on a complete stand. So they do, do absolutely do not... Um, agree uh, on the way they view immigration, which it's it's very fascinating to see a Central American country be completely upset how they've handled it. Yes. And I think it's it's ex it's exposing Biden. And I think it's great for Bukele to have this uh, way to look at it, because right now Mexico feels no pressure. I mean, Almo, yes. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure, folks, if you guys see you guys should check out Almo's uh, last uh, meeting with Biden in D.C. You should see how Almo spoke to Biden. It's, he really spoke to him like a from a position of power. Mm -hmm. they, Mexico came to us. So it's interesting to see how El Salvador has completely disagreed with the way uh, United States immigration policy and they don't come to terms to work with them because Kamala keeps um, framing the issue around climate change. Yes. I mean, yes. I haven't spoke, I, I'm still waiting till this day for a Venezuelan migrant to tell me that the reason he's coming from Caracas to Yuma, Arizona is because it's too hot. I'm still <laughs> waiting for that. So uh, wherever that migrant is, we're trying to find you, but that's right. it's it's truly fascinating right yeah, now. Yeah, got to fact check Camel on that. <laughs> um, okay, so this is a really interesting angle of the immigration issue, which is the relationship with, you know, our, our global uh fellow countries and so on, you've got other countries' children being trafficked here by cartels. Their citizens, their, their underage citizens, mm -hmm. are turning up working in American poultry farms, egg farms, marijuana farms, and so on. To me, this undermines American credibility in some ways, because how can we be lecturing other countries about human rights? How could we be lecturing Saudi Arabia about how they treat journalists? How could we be lecturing China about how they treat the Uyghurs if we are having this pipeline of other countries' children come into our country and being put under the lash of indentured servitude? That's why when I'm doing my reporting, I, I think it's correct to frame this as a uh, obviously call it a border crisis, but I like to call it a humanitarian crisis. And the reason why I go with humanitarian is because Americans, when they hear the word humanitarian crisis, they think, oh, well, that doesn't happen here. Mm. That happens in Yemen mm. or in the Middle East. I mean, it's, li it's literally happening here. And it's also important. Uh, the migrants that are coming are not just coming from Central America. Um, they are coming from South America and they're coming from the Middle East and they're coming from Europe. So when we're in Yuma, we're running into migrants from over 100 different countries. So that's something to, to, to also remember is we have the whole world coming to our borders and I think we're also losing respect on the on on the just the ground stage when it comes to foreign policy. Um, El Salvador and a lot of Central American countries don't respect us right now. China's mm -hmm. never respected us on immigration. Uh, J Japan for sure does never respect us on immigration. I, I read a lot of uh, political commentators from Japan to see what they think about us. And the thing is too is um, the migrants themselves even becoming like an American and all that. It's becoming watered down. And what I mean by that is, you know, last year when I started reporting on the border crisis, you know, I'm there with my camera, or whatever. You know, migrants didn't want to be filmed. You know, they would cover their faces and, and rightfully so. Fast forward to today, I'm, you know, have cameras there. Migrants now are literally on Facebook Live mm -hmm. crossing illegally or on FaceTime. Yeah. Um, so they even don't respect American law and it's it's communicated already all over the world. And um, even like uh, leaders like Maduro, what I'm hearing from sources in Venezuela is 
they're just letting these migrants come and they don't care. And for Maduro, it's better because anyone leaving Venezuela means they don't support them. Um, but it just shows that no one respects the United States right That's now. That's right. And if another country citizen comes here and something happens to them in the course of, you know, the, the, the crime, the, these deaths, whatever, and then that other country, it becomes a diplomatic crisis. It mm -hmm. could be. What I'm saying is I foresee something horrible happening to some other country citizen. And if they chose to make that a diplomatic crisis, they would have a lot of leverage over the United States if they decided to put force the issue of, well, you know, jo the Joe Biden administration um, set up this lattice of policies that lured our citizen there, exposed them to all this crime and all these problems, and they lost their life or they lost this or they lost that. And um, it's a form of diplomatic leverage if, if something happens to their citizens and they choose to make a big issue of it. So it's th these are angles of the immigration policy that no one really considers or discusses, but it really opens up our country to risk. It delegitimizes our country. It puts the American people um, on weaker footing across the globe. So um, a couple other angles I wanted to um, explore with you. Number one is what do you see in terms of gang activity, MS-13 or, or drug activity, all these unsavory elements that clearly you want less of in your country that we are getting more of through the border policies? Yeah, one of the crazier things now reporting at the border is um, the cartels have, have uh, moved to uh, TikTok to communicate with young teens. So what they're doing right now is they're luring, they're luring American teens, 17, 18 year olds, 16 year olds, and getting them either from um, you know Phoenix to get to drive to Yuma or they live in San Antonio to get to the border here in South Texas and are beginning smuggling migrants. So we're actually been interviewing sheriffs have been running into, they, they've been surprised the amount of American teenagers, not Mexican nationals, American teenagers that have uh, been sold this kind of pipeline dream of, you know, hey, just transport a couple of migrants from us, here's $2,000, $3,000. So we're seeing American teenagers being used um, by the cartels. They're actually putting a lot of the American people in risk because they're getting in a lot of human smuggling car chases. Um, because of the open border policy, um, obviously we have a less lot of border patrol agents on the line um, actually defending like fentanyl coming in and, and cartels. They're, they have been used to apprehend these family units. So now we're seeing uh, the gotaways, which to me is the extremely scary number. So right now the fiscal year just ended, guys. We have 2 million um, um, apprehensions. So that's, that, that's obviously a lot. The scarier number is we're closer to right now, according to some sources I spoke to, uh, 1 million gotaways. So if you guys heard this term gotaways, it's migrants that basically come into the country illegally that Border Patrol was able to detect with technologies through cameras or other things, but because they didn't have the manpower to stop them, they come into the country. So we have close to 1 million gotaways. These are individuals we do, we do not know of. And the reason why I'm, uh, it's important is because uh, the people that you are seeing at least being caught by Border Patrol or wanting to turn themselves in, they're just families. They want to be apprehended. They know that they're going to be processed. The people that don't want to be apprehended are either connected to cartel or already have criminal activity or either smuggling drugs into this country. Um, and it's it's playing a huge role in the fentanyl because less Border Patrol agents are at the port of entry. Um, now more fentanyl is coming in through the port of entry. So we're seeing that. I mean, I think already Texas DPS already sees enough fentanyl to kill every American in, in the United States. Uh, you already know the stats, right? 18, 18 to 45 um, Americans aged there opioids are now the leading cause of death so it's, it's huge it's playing a role there but the the thing that they've been alarmed is the gotaway so that's a it's a that's already a national security issue and then the the cartel tactics of communication with american teenagers bringing these teenagers to the border them smuggling migrants and the fentanyl through um the port of entry the other issue now is um the fbi uh terror watch list so we have already now already apprehended over 70 individuals on the FBI terror watch list that's tried to come into the country. Uh, Bill Malugin of Fox News have done a great job on that on that issue. If you actually combine uh, all of Trump's years, I, I believe we don't even get to like five individuals on the terror watch list or like not even to uh, double digits. Um, I think one of the last individuals coming in um, from Yemen. So the, the national security has been an issue, but from the cartel side, they've been um, even more empowered. And for them, um, these migrants are like the perfect tactic because they put these migrants in areas over one border, border patrol and that's when you see the fentanyl the gotaways a lot of the folks in like the camouflage gear we were just mm -hmm. in Aravaca, arizona which was in tucson sector so the tucson sector leads in gotaways so you're not going to see the family units there right you're going to mm -hmm. see the bad guys um also in that in that area um we notice is you'll see a lot of the what we call carpet shoes mm -hmm. so a lot of the smugglers wear these shoes where that that hide their tracks 
and things like that from uh, Border Patrol. But the gotaways number is extremely scary. Yes, that's right. Okay, and pivoting to another angle of this, because you have spoken with so many Americans who live in these border towns who are dealing with the effects of this. Um, I wondered about the economic impacts that, that they speak to, because uh, and one thing that I think is driving some of these political shifts in the border counties in Texas, um, that as, as you've pointed out, very, very longtime Democratic voters, mm -hmm. um, the issue of economic pressure and competition is that if you are a recent immigrant or even a not so recent immigrant, one of the last things that you want is to be outcompeted for jobs and wages by millions of new arrivals every single year mm -hmm. in your community, in your town, in your state, in your industry, whatever it is. If you believe in the law of supply and demand at all, you are going to have downward pressure on wages and competition for job slots. So I wondered if you have encountered with some of these individuals, them speaking about the economic pressures associated with uh, high volume immigration policies or some of the industries that uh, that you encountered the migrants saying that they intend to work in or anything like that. Yes, yeah, so I've interviewed um, residents all from, you know, Roma, Del Rio, all through South Texas who have expressed the worry. The thing for them, for the workers is... Um, exactly what you said is these folks coming in and then undermining in them. So that, that's a huge issue. Um, that's one thing they've been extremely concerned that the, the main thing with these border towns being overrun for them is the um, economic pressure, but also um, all the money they're spending on resources that they don't even get. So what I mean is like when they call 911 and the ambulance is not there or they call a uh, law enforcement and they're not there. I, um, we were in Maverick County and what they were telling me is that, their local law enforcement is so overwhelmed in assisting Border Patrol that they're actually starting to get calls for domestic violence mm -hmm. and they can't get to them. Mm -hmm. So they can't even get, get to them for two to three hours. So that the huge issue for them is the uh, public safety, even the economic is almost tied together. Yes. So in Del Rio, when they actually had the 15,000 Haitians in the port of entry closed, um, a lot of restaurants actually couldn't even open up. So they were losing, um, the city of Del Rio lost $17,000 a day, but a lot of businesses, I mean, they lost hundreds and hundreds because they couldn't bring in workers right. or any of that or the, or the, or the there weren't any customers there because they were scared that they were being overrun by these Haitians. Um, so that's an issue. And, and one thing that it's important to point out, these aren't like when I'm in that, when I'm interviewing these people in there, these aren't um, like white Republicans. These are Hispanic Democratic voters who are saying, hey, I understand the issue. I get it. I'm an immigrant myself. But this is absurd. Like, yep. this is just unruly yep. um, uh, at this point. We interviewed a, uh, this mother in Del Rio who I felt good of her. She has an issue where um, she's a retired mother. She's on a fixed income where migrants are coming in illegally and then they hide in her lawn. Gosh. So she has to put up these new fences. She's already spent about uh, $10,000 in fencing. So one thing that, that gets lost for a lot of people is the peace of mind. I also interviewed a, a, a rancher uh, by the name of uh, Eddie in Del Rio where he has, uh, and he's giving me the video, uh, video and photo evidence, his um, Mexican nationals have broken into their home as they're sleeping. So he's had to wake up in the middle of the night with a gun, mm -hmm. scaring off these, uh, scaring off these migrants. So that the huge issue for them is that um, one of the things I wanted to actually talk about is uh, Uvalde. So for mm -hmm. folks who don't know, one of the uh, main reasons, uh, key reasons that Uvalde police was actually pretty late to the response of the shooting was Uvalde is 40 miles from the border, but it's a hot zone for drug smugglers mm -hmm. because they have a train that runs through there. So it's it's a normal thing where every day there's constant just drug chases with smugglers all around uh, the, the, the town. So when that happened with, with Uvalde, the shooting, um, it's first of all, it's already a little uh, police force, but they thought it was another drug smuggler. So that's why they're like, oh, well, this is just another day in the park. And little did they know it, it ended up being something much serious. But that's something that isn't talked about is it's really the peace of mind for these people. They don't feel that they're safe in their own home. Um, you won't see kind of kids playing out in the yard anymore. All that mm -hmm. stuff is over. And that that's the number one concern. And, the, and like I said, the, the big thing is they don't get the media kind of uh, response because they're not Martha's Vineyard. And it's like, these are just working class people um, that are literally loyal to the Democratic Party. Um, but now we're seeing that flip and uh, I'm fascinated to see that political yes. shift in the next few months. And these are people who have been horribly exploited. And when you look up the economic data in some of these border counties, I mean, average income, what, like $20,000? Mm -hmm. Like, come on. These are people on uh, without a lot of advantage in life. They And many of them, the the there's competition now uh, for public services. There's competition for jobs. Wages are declining. Inflation is, is getting worse. And on top of all of that, one of the main reasons that people come to America for a quote-unquote better life is to have those basic elements of society, peace of mind, 
law and order, someone keeping the peace, making sure that when you work for something in this country, there is enough of legitimate law enforcement and protection of the citizens' interests that they will they, they that they can build something. Right. And these are people who are being horribly exploited. They cannot build anything because they the next they make you know five thousand dollars, they need to invest it in a fence to keep drug traffickers out of their front lawn. It's a horrible situation. And Paige, you know what would drive you crazy if you went down there and spoke to some of these ranchers, find out how much money yeah. they spent? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I don't even want to No, <laughs> it's it's horrible. It's a horrible thing that our government is doing to our own people. And that's why your work is so important because so many of the mainstream reporters frame it like it's this totally spontaneous accident that all of these mm -hmm. people are showing up and poor Biden is so, you know, beset on all sides by this awful border crisis. Well, climate change. It's yeah. all climate. Yeah, it's all the climate <laughs> refugees. Totally spontaneous. You can't do anything about it. And and the fact is that our government is doing this to our own people. And um, in closing, there's one other thing I wanted to address, which is this huge story that has kind of fallen off the radar, which is that a couple of months ago, there was this big issue of this 10 year old in Ohio who had a, who was transported to, mm. I think it was Indiana, mm -hmm. to get an abortion uh, because she had been raped repeatedly by her mother's boyfriend, who was an illegal immigrant. And the question that I have is why was the only network interested in getting to the bottom of this story, Telemundo. And I was reading a lot of the commentary from readers uh, of the Telemundo reporters and so on saying, people don't understand how often this type of gruesome, ghastly crime happens in some of these communities. And the law enforcement response is totally, their hands are tied because when the when it's an immigration issue, then that involves correspondence yep. with the federal law enforcement and they don't want to expose how pervasive this issue is. Yeah, I, I have have to give huge credit. Telemundo does actually some of the best reporting at yes. the border because they don't really look at the politics, they always look at the human aspect. That story, I mean, you could only imagine how often it is it's happening. And the thing is, what people forget is what I feel bad about these migrant children, who is looking out for them? Like who like I don't even know what's what's the word if they need like an agent or they need some type of like literally like a lawyer sponsor because it's like who's following up on them on their conditions like even when they get released are we a month later are they okay are they like can we check up on them so that's one thing that I've been trying to highlight is um, there's no follow for these kids mm -hmm. um, even in the migrant facilities we've been reports of them being you know sexually assaulted but who are they supposed to go to they don't speak the language they're just you know they're, they're these small children in this new country it is gruesome and what was also horrible about the story is the mother trying to play a role in covering up obfuscating uh, co covering up the, that story and i love how you know mainstream media for them it, it was just about the abortion headline mm -hmm. that was it and and they didn't want to look into it and as long as they could virtual signal to their audience um but it's it's a really sad thing and i think we forget of what these migrant children are going through uh in the u.s it's a very very dark system and a lot of them are also putting put through the foster care system that's not even the greatest systems of, of, of all that's been my number one concern is we have no follow-up we have no no one to hold these people accountable um and this is happening under the under the guise and under the eyes of the U.S. government. Exactly. And again, I want to point listeners who have not uh, heard this previous episode of my podcast to the episode entitled The Biden Doctrine, Human Sacrifices for Open Borders, where I address this issue specifically and where I covered the fact that uh, a, a reporter in Columbus, Ohio, went to Columbus, Ohio, where this happened, and they were trying to get some answers out of Child Protective Services in that county. And what they discovered was that the child was still living with the quote unquote quote mother who let the quote unquote boyfriend rape the 10 year old. And the reporter was pointing out it is very, mm -hmm. it, it is unheard of for child protective services to let a rape victim who is an underage child live, it, continually live in the home. And the, the extent to which criminal, ghastly criminal activity is being protected by the government, by services that Americans pay for so that they can disguise the downsides of open borders is really astonishing. It is beneath this country. It is it is totally beneath the dignity of the United States. And that is something that I really wish our politicians would address. It's sad. And like like we were speaking earlier, it's, where's the progressive? These are black and brown children are being yeah. labor trafficked, sex trafficked, um, but no outrage because... Uh, it's happening with a president with a D next to his name. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, I want to thank you for your time, Jorge. You are doing an incredible job on the border, bringing this information to the American people, um, being a voice for the people, saying this is wrong, and, and helping them learn about what's happening. Thank you so much, Paige, for having me on. And uh, we 
we need to be having more conversations about this, especially long form about um, immigration. So the audience is, is really well rounded on the uh, how really deadly the humanitarian crisis is that's happening every single day here. That's right. And how the policies are connected to these outcomes. It's not spontaneous. It's in a way it's by design. So thank you for coming on to This Is Your Country. Thank you.